Hello everyone, welcome to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in today's video I will be teaching you biological molecules focusing specifically on proteins. If you have just stumbled on my channel, please know that I am posting the chronological order of the AS and A Level Biology syllabus here on YouTube so it is easy for you to follow if you start from the very beginning, which is chapter 1.1 Introduction to Cells and Microscopy. In in this video, I will simply be showing you what proteins are made of, the different structures of proteins, and will also be sharing examples of proteins such as hemoglobin and collagen. Something else that you should know regarding my channel is that on this channel, I will be doing some past papers, so you definitely don't want to miss out on that. Make sure you turn on notifications. So to start us off, we first need to understand why proteins are so important. Proteins are macromolecules and they are very important in our nutrition. All enzymes that we have within our bodies are proteins, but it is important to know that not all proteins are enzymes. Proteins form an essential part of the cell membrane, and you will see this when we get into chapter 4 and we discuss cell membranes and transport, because what we do there is we zoom into the cell membrane, and you can see that proteins are used to form transport channels within the cell membrane in order to allow certain molecules to pass through. Some hormones such as insulin and glucagon are proteins. Insulin and glucagon are very important in controlling blood glucose concentration and that is something that you will come in contact with when you get to chapter 14 which is homeostasis. You also have oxygen carrying pigments in the blood such as hemoglobin and myoglobin which are proteins. Like I said earlier, in this video I am going to discuss hemoglobin but we do not get into any detailed myoglobin. Antibodies in our bodies are also proteins. Antibodies form part of our immune system, so when we fall ill, we produce antibodies in order to fight the causative agent of the illness. All our antibodies are proteins, and this is something we learn at AS level when we get to chapter 11, which focuses on immunity. Collagen is also a protein and it strengthens tissues. You've probably heard that taking collagen would make your skin look young and plump, but that's because it strengthens the tissues and it reduces signs of aging. Keratin is another protein which is found in hair, nails, and the skin surface layer. Actin and myosin are proteins in muscles, and we will discuss them in more detail when we get to muscle contractions in chapter 15 in A-level chapters. And proteins can also be storage products, but we don't go into any detail about that in the syllabus. Again, I invite you to remember form. So if you're watching my videos for the very first time, this probably looks very odd to you, which is again why I suggest that you start from the very beginning. Form is basically a way to remember the monomers of the different polymers we're studying in this chapter. So form stands for fatty acids, organic bases, amino acids, and monosaccharides. And what these are are the monomers of the different polymers that we are studying. So the polymers such as lipids, proteins, polysaccharides, and nucleic acids. For this chapter, we don't touch on nucleic acids at all. That's a different chapter on its own, which we will discuss later in detail. Now, just like we saw on the chat, proteins are made up of amino acids, which means amino acids are the monomers used to form proteins. Amino acids have a very interesting structure, which you are required to learn, because in many CAIE past questions, you will see that you're sometimes asked to draw the amino acid structure, and even asked to go a little further, which is something I'll show you as we go on. So the first thing to note here is that amino acids have what we call an amine group on the left. This amine group is simply NH2 and it is bound to a carbon in the center and that carbon is bound to a carboxylic acid group. Now it is important to note that proteins or rather amino acids only have one central carbon and the second carbon is part of a carboxylic acid group. The reason why I make this distinction is because I usually see that students make the mistake of repeating the carbon 
and then drawing a carboxylic acid group. So they end up having three carbons in the basic structure of an amino acid, but that is not how it works. It is one central carbon, a carboxylic acid group on the right, an amine group on the left, a hydrogen on top and a side chain at the bottom of the carbon group. Now the side chain can be different. Sometimes it is simply hydrogen, but it changes with time. You can see that depending on the amino acid that you're studying, the side chain can be any compound at all. An interesting way for you to remember this, and this is how I teach my students in my classroom, is I tell them to think of the amino acid uh, structure as a marriage between two people. So here you have the amine group, which we will call amine, and the carboxylic group, which we will call carbo, and the carbon in between them can be seen as a diamond ring that is joining them together, considering diamonds are simply made from carbon. We also have the hydrogen here on top, and I tell them to imagine the hydrogen as the name of the person joining Amy and Cabo together. So that could be Pastor Herbert, it could be Iman, Imam Ahmed, whichever name you can pick up, pick up depending on your religion that starts with an H to help you remember. And unfortunately, we have the side chain, which we refer to as the side chick in my classroom. And the side chain is always different. Sometimes the side chain looks exactly like Amy because it's also an aiming group. So that's just a fun way for you to recall amino acids and I hope it's helpful to you. Now, it's also important to know that the simplest amino acid is glycine. As you can see from the structure of glycine, you can see there that the amine group is on the left, the carboxylic group is on the right, the carbon that joins them together is in the center, there's a hydrogen attached to it on top, and the side chain of glycine is also hydrogen. That is why it looks the way that it does. But the interesting thing now is that we don't have amino acids simply standing on their own and claiming to be proteins. In order for us to form a protein, we need to join amino acids together. And that is where the formation of a peptide bond comes in. As you can see in this image over here, we have one glycine on the left and we have another glycine on the right. The way the peptide bond is formed is that the OH group from the carboxyl group of one amino acid will react with the hydrogen on the amine group of the next amino acid and that will release water. Once water is released, we will then have a line over here which we refer to as the peptide bond. But what you need to bear in mind when you look at this bond, you will see here that the carboxylic group no longer has a OH attached to it. That is because we've given off that OH as part of water. And the amine group as well only has one hydrogen left on it. It doesn't have the hydrogen, the other hydrogen, because that has been added up to give water. So it is important to just bear that in mind. When we combine two amino acids together, we form what we call a dipeptide. A dipeptide simply means that there are two amino acids that are in this structure. So if you think back to the carbohydrates um, slide or the carbohydrates lesson rather, you will remember that when you join two monosaccharides together, you get what we call a disaccharide. In the same way, when you join two amino acids together, you get what we call a dipeptide. And the bond that is formed between amino acids is called a peptide bond. This is very important and I invite students to learn how to draw this peptide bond, how to join different amino acids together, because being able to do this is very crucial and is a question that has been asked many times in CAIE past papers. So if we have the release of water when we join two amino acids together, what do we call that reaction? Again, it is the condensation reaction. So remember from the very first lesson focusing on biological molecules, I said that a condensation reaction is what occurs when we join two compounds together and in the process we release water as a byproduct. So that doesn't change simply because we are dealing with proteins, the principles remain the same. 
When we join two amino acids together, like I said, we get what we call a dipeptide. When we join many amino acids together, we have a polypeptide. So again, think back to the very first lesson on chapter two, which is titled chapter 2.1 on this channel. You will remember that I said, when you join two monomers together, it becomes a dimonomer, but many repeating units of a monomer is simply a polymer. So in the same way, the polymer here would be a polypeptide, which is called a protein chain sometimes. There are different structures of proteins which are very important to know. Well, some people call them structures. I like to think of them as levels of structure, but thinking of them that way can sometimes be very, very confusing because you sometimes have proteins which simply stay at a certain level and do not go on to the next. So we can call it structures. There are four different structures of proteins. You have the primary structure, you have the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and the quaternary structure. I usually try to remember this by simply thinking of my education. So I went through primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, and because I went on to get a PhD, then I call that a quaternary education. So what are these structures and what exactly do they look like? The primary structure of a protein is the sequence of amino acids that make up the polypeptide chain. So when we refer to the primary structure, we are not necessarily referring to a shape. We are referring to the fact that there is a combination of amino acids in a chain and that makes up the primary structure. So by simply joining many amino acids together to form a polypeptide, you are forming what we call a primary structure. And as you might be able to see from the image I have put under primary structure, Structure. You will see that the primary structure means that all the amino acids are simply joined by peptide bonds. So you can think of them as a straight line of amino acids joined together by the peptide bond that I showed you in the previous slide. We also have the secondary structure, and this is where things start to get interesting because the secondary structure refers to shapes. You can have what we call an alpha helix, or you can have what we call a beta sheet. And I have put images here on the side so that you can be able to see what exactly they look like. The alpha helix is formed as a result of hydrogen bonds forming between the oxygen of the CO group of one amino acid, so the carboxylic group, and the hydrogen of the amine group of another amino acid that is four places ahead of it. So remember we said that the primary structure is simply a chain of amino acids. Now when these interactions start to happen, so we have the COO group because we formed them into a chain, right? So it's no longer a COOH, it's now a CO group. That CO group, the oxygen of that will bind with the hydrogen of the amine group that is four places ahead of it in the polypeptide chain of the primary structure. And due to that happening, we start to have a folding. If we were in a physical classroom, we were going to practice this using paper, but unfortunately we are not. So I hope that you are able to grasp it or you're able to watch more animation videos on YouTube so that you can understand it. The second type of secondary structure, which are the beta pleated sheets, are basically a looser form of the alpha helix, which means that when these hydrogen bonds form, they don't necessarily result in the alpha helix, but they can cause a much looser shape called the beta pleated sheet. Something important to note is that the alpha helix and the beta pleated sheet are formed by hydrogen bonds. These hydrogen bonds are strong enough to hold them in shape, but they can easily be broken by high temperature and changes in pH. This is very important because you will find in some CIE past questions, you are asked to state what is responsible for breaking a particular type of bond in a protein structure. So bearing in mind that the primary structure of a protein is referred to as the sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain and the secondary structure can either be an alpha helix and a beta or a beta pleated sheet, it is important to understand what the tertiary structure is. The tertiary structure is simply a folding of the protein in order to form a precise 
three-dimensional shape. The secondary structure is responsible for the formation of active sites if the protein is an enzyme because it enables the creation of that site by simply folding properly. What is also important to know is that the bonds that allow the folding of the protein are bonds that are formed between the side chains of the amino acid. So if you recall the structure of an amino acid, and you can always re rewind this video just to look at it again, you will remember that we said there is an amine group on the left, there is a carboxylic group on the right, there is a carbon between the two of them, there is a hydrogen attached to the top of that carbon, and then there is a side chain attached to the bottom of the carbon, which can be anything ranging from hydrogen to another amine group or even to another carboxylic group. It is also important to know that the bonds that form between these different side chains are dependent on what the side chain is itself. So the properties of the side chains determine the kinds of bonds that are formed. So for example, we have hydrogen bonds that are formed between very polar groups like the NHCO and OH groups. Hydrogen bonds are broken by changes in temperature or a change in pH. We also have disulfide bonds. Disulfide bonds are formed between two cysteine molecules. Cysteine is a kind of amino acid and it has a side chain that contains sulfur. So because of that, the sulfur atoms bind to each other in order to form a disulfide bond. And this can only be broken by adding reducing agents to the protein. The ionic bonds are formed between ionized amine groups and ionized carboxylic acid groups, and they are broken by changes in pH. What I want to point out here is that when we say an amino acid is ionized, we simply mean that it has a charge on it. So as you can see here, the amine group in this example has a positive charge on it, while while the carboxylic group has a negative charge on it. What that suggests is that there is either an atom missing or there is an extra atom that has been added that is then causing these changes. And by changing the pH, which means by adding either an acid or a base to the protein, you would be able to break an ionic bond. The last kind of bond is the hydrophobic interactions, which forms between nonpolar side groups. Now, if you recall our lesson from lipids, and if you haven't watched that video, I suggest that you do. It's chapter 2.2, lipids. If you watch that, you will remember or you will see that we have a kind of lipid called a phospholipid. A phospholipid is a lipid that makes up the cell membrane, and it has a phosphate head and two hydrophobic fatty acid tails. And we said at the end of that video that the fatty acid tails tend to relate with each other simply because they are trying to avoid the water environment. In the same way, when speaking of amino acids, we can see that hydrophobic interactions simply allow the hydrophobic groups to cluster together and we can see that as a, as a kind of bond, even though it's not a bond in the conventional sense. The last kind of protein structure is the quaternary structure. And the quaternary structure, just like the primary structure, is rather interesting. The quaternary structure simply means that the proteins are made up of two or more polypeptide chains. And the association of these chains is called the quaternary structure. The quaternary structure, just like the tertiary structure, is held together by hydrogen bonds, disulfide bonds, ionic bonds or hydrophobic interactions. So the best way to remember the quaternary structure is to simply look at the protein that you're being asked about and to see if it has two or more polypeptide chains. If it does, then you can conclude that it has a quaternary structure. So to recap, we can say the primary structure is the sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide chain. The secondary structure can either be an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet. The tertiary structure is formed by the folding of the protein to form a three-dimensional shape and it is governed by four different types of bonds, the hydrogen bonds, the disulfide bonds, hydrophobic interactions, and ionic bonds. The quaternary structure is when the protein is made up of two or more polypeptide chains and it is governed by the same bonds that are formed in the tertiary structure. Okay, 
let's get into the different types of proteins. We have two main types that we have to focus on for this syllabus. The first type is the globular protein. And when we say globular, I want you to imagine the image of the globe. So if you're a person who loves geography or you love to collect artifacts, you could probably have this in your home. The globe is represented in the form of a ball. And when you look through it, you can see the different countries and continents. So when you think of it that way, there are proteins that curl up into a ball for their tertiary structure. And the reason why they do this is because they have hydrophobic chains or hydrophobic side groups, which they then keep in the center of the protein while the hydrophilic groups remain on the outside and can relate well with the blood. So think of globular proteins as proteins that are simply trying to protect their hydrophobic side groups. You also have fibrous proteins. Fibrous proteins do not curl up into a ball. So think of fiber or you can think of a ball of twine. Fibrous proteins simply form long strands. They are not soluble in water and most of their structure or rather most of their function is structural. So examples of these include collagen and keratin. Collagen which is found in the skin and also found in the muscles and keratin which can be found in your hair and your nails. An example of a globular protein is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is very important in the human body. It carries oxygen and it is part of a red blood cell. Now the structure of hemoglobin can be a little bit tricky if you don't pay attention. Hemoglobin has four polypeptide chains. So if I say it has four polypeptide chains, what kind of protein structure is that? It is a quaternary structure because it has two or more polypeptide chains. So just thought to throw that in there to help you recall how we remember the structures of proteins. Each polypeptide chain is called a globin. And a globin can either be an alpha globin or a beta globin. Hemoglobin is made of two alpha globin chains and two beta globin chains. And all of these associate together to form the quaternary structure of hemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin, when you look at it, is a nearly spherical compound. But obviously, when you're looking at the structure drawn on this image, you're thinking, what? That doesn't look anything like a circle. What happens with hemoglobin is that it has hydrophobic groups that point towards the center of the protein. So they are shielded um, from the from the surrounding water environment and you have the hydrophilic groups on the outside that are able to relate well with water. The hydrophobic interactions on the inside of the protein are very important for maintaining its 3D shape because if these hydrophobic groups do not relate with each other then we are not going to have the folding. So think of hemoglobin as a sheet of paper, a plain sheet of paper that you are holding horizontally and in the center on the upside of this paper that's the side facing you. You have all of these hydrophobic chains. And what those hydrophobic chains do is that they come together to interact with each other because they don't want to come in contact with water. Once you put, bear that in mind, you will see that your mind will immediately start to fold that paper in order to form the interaction. That is the same way hemoglobin works. And that is important in maintaining its 3D structure. Now, something to bear in mind is that each polypeptide chain, so each alpha globin or beta globin chain, has what we call a heme group. And the heme group is not made of amino acids. It's called a prosthetic group that is simply attached to hemoglobin. This heme group is important because it is the one that carries the ion atoms. And that ion atom is what binds to oxygen. So one molecule of oxygen, which is denoted as O2, can bind to one ion atom and so that means that the four heme groups in hemoglobin can bind to four oxygen molecules and this obviously speaks to the reason why sometimes when you feel dizzy or you feel out of breath or you just feel disoriented and weak the doctor will check for your iron levels because if your iron levels are low then chances are you are unable to transport oxygen efficiently to hemoglobin which can then be carried around the blood to sustain your body Something else to bear in mind is that when 
hemoglobin is bound to oxygen it is bright red in color but when there is no oxygen it is close to purple and i bet you can recognize this in when a person is deprived of oxygen and they change color sometimes people turn blue and you're able to see that they don't have enough oxygen in them Okay, let's go to our last example of protein. So like we said, there are two types of proteins. We have globular proteins and we have fibrous proteins. Hemoglobin is an example of a globular protein simply because it is folded in such a way that its hydrophobic groups are on the inside of the protein while its hydrophilic groups relate with the water environment on the outside. Fibrous proteins, on the other hand, are not folded proteins in terms of the fact that they don't form a globular shape, so they don't have a spherical shape. They form strands instead, and collagen is an example of that. So, so collagen is the most common protein found in animals. It is insoluble simply because it provides a structural function. If you think about plants and the fact that they have a cell wall made of cellulose, which is for structure, then think of collagen as the protein that is responsible for structure in humans. But also bear in mind that cellulose is not a protein, it is a carbohydrate. Collagen also has three polypeptide chains which are wound around each other in helices, just like it is shown in this image over here. So if it has three polypeptide chains, what kind of structure is that? It is a quaternary structure because it has two or more polypeptide chains. The three chains are held together by hydrogen and covalent bonds and almost every third amino acid in the chain is called glycine. The reason glycine is very frequent, frequent in collagen structure is because it's a very small molecule and what it does is that it allows the strands of collagen or the polypeptides that make up collagen to bind tightly together so that the helix is not um, loose rather it is very tight and that also enhances its structural function. So just like I have said, collagen molecules are three-stranded and they're held by side by side by covalent bonds between the side groups of the amino acids next to each other. So you can see from this image that I have put over here that we start off with one polypeptide chain and then we have three chains being assembled together and you can see how wound they are and then we have them just being um, reshipped properly and assembled into our muscle cells so we usually find collagen a lot within the muscle tissue so just to share some advantages of collagen, it is a very flexible protein. It has high tensile strength, which means it is very strong and not easy to break. So it's very hard for you to break your muscle, no matter how hard you try. You can cause a tear in your muscle when you lift heavy weights, but that doesn't mean you break them. Collagen fibers also line up according to the forces they must withstand, which means they are arranged in a way to maximize their structural function so that they do not cause any problems problems in terms of structure to that tissue. This brings us to the end of the lesson on proteins. Um, if you would like to watch this video again, please do so. If you have any questions, make sure you post them in the chat. I would invite you to watch the earlier videos that I have posted where I have shared the chronological content of chapter one and I am now doing so with chapter two. At the end of chapter two, I will be sharing some past questions on video just to show you how to answer multiple choice questions and a couple of structured questions from past papers and the next topic we will be covering on biological molecules which also happens to be the last section is water that's going to be a very short video so make sure you don't miss it thank you for joining me on my channel don't forget to hit the subscribe button i will post my next video very soon have a good time goodbye